Okay, so welcome everybody to this around the world session, adding to our content at the Genesis 2020 com, uh, conference. And this one is, is an area I think that many people have been looking at and wanting to understand, and some understand it more than others, but the potential impact of cell and gene therapy clearly can't have escaped the notice of anybody. But I think what's been interesting for me is how different countries have looked to adopt and, and scale their abilities in the whole space of translating great science into new products. And we have three examples on, on the call today who are going to discuss what it looks like from their perspective in different parts of the world. So without more from me, I'll allow Adrian Tutungi from Taylor Wessing, who is going to moderate the session to take over and take you through sharing of the content. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tony. It's great to be here and to have this opportunity. And Sharon, Arno and Thomas, thank you for joining me. Um, should we start with some introductions? If you just um, give, give us a brief resume about your involvement in cell and gene therapy and what your current role is, that would be great. Sharon, can we start with you, please? Sharon Brownlow, I am the uh, Chief I'm the uh, Chief Business Officer at this prior to that working in uh, Viral Vector CDMOs. Sharon, I'm having some difficulties hearing you. Tony Arno, can you hear Sharon okay? Um, no, not really. Sharon, would you could, you could you give it one more go? Um, I think the, uh, the uh, I'm not sure if you can hear. Is anybody else? Yeah, we're not picking up Sharon there. I don't know if we can give that another go, Sharon, maybe. Yeah, is is it just me who's having trouble? Because I I can barely hear you guys either. We heard you very clearly just then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it seems it seems back now. Um, hang on, I seems like she's gone again. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, I, uh, I, I can hear everybody now, but now I have no video from anybody. Well, we can hear you fine, Sharon. Ah, you're back, you're back. Okay, right, I think we're okay now. Sorry about this. No problem. Do you want to um, just go through your introduction again, because we didn't really get any of it. <laughs> Hi. I'm Sharon Brownlow. I am the Chief Business Officer at the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult, who are based in the UK, in London, Stevenage and Braintree. Been with the Catapult for about four years. Prior to that, working in manufacturing of um, viral vectors and other biologics. Great, thank you. Arno, can we go to you, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm Arno de Renivier. I'm a Senior Manager in Business Development and Operations at C3i. Um, I have a scientific background. I actually did my PhD and postdoc at Cambridge at the Bayram Institute, uh, right there uh, next to the, uh, the one nucleus offices. Um, I've been with C3I for about four years now um, and developed expertise in CMO operations, especially in the preclinical uh, tech transfer and phase one, phase two uh, clinical trials. C3I is a CMO organized around the 37,000 square foot CGMP um, facility, um, which also has a, an analytical development and biomarker discovery department, as well as a CR services uh, that manages cell and gene therapy clinical trials around North America. Great, thank you for that. And Thomas? Yeah, of course. So uh, I'm Thomas Tratler, so I'm heading the Executive Department for Business Development and Patent Management at the Fraunhofer Institute for Cell Therapy and Immunology, quartered in, in Leipzig, uh, uh, Germany. Yeah, regarding my professional background uh, in very, very brief biologist by profession, 
I did my master and my, my PhD uh, uh, in my two PhD thesis in fundamental research with Planck Society in biochemistry, then a joint industry, spent 10 years in drug discovery, drug development, the German pharmaceutical company. Uh, so we successfully brought a drug, an in-licensed drug candidate from early preclinical to, to market approval. And then uh, as we were obviously kind of successful, we uh, were just bought by the British pharma giant Shire in 2008 for uh, $500 million. This was a quite nice event for our investors. However, it also brought to us the, the chance to look for a new professional perspective. And uh, yeah, then I joined uh, sooner or later Fraunhofer 10 years ago now and being in charge of establishing a global business in, in, in biomedicine. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and as I say, thank you to you all for joining us and sharing your insights. I think this is going to be a really great session. By way of very brief introduction of myself, my name is Adrian Tutunji. I'm a partner at Taylor Wessing. We like to think that we're Europe's leading law firm when it comes to life sciences. Uh, I'm based in our Cambridge office, so we do have offices elsewhere in the UK and spread across Europe and, and North America and the Far East as well. Um, and I was counsel to the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult for a number of years, right from its inception. So Sharon, I don't think our paths ever crossed um, during my Catapult no. days, but I have a particular interest in ATMPs and Cell and Gene Therapy. Um, yeah. So with that, if we, you've all mentioned that part of your roles at the moment are involved in business development, and I guess your organizations um, are interested and have particular responsibilities uh, for fostering the development of the sector in your respective countries, but also you undoubtedly keep an eye on what's going on internationally. So it would be interesting just to get, I think, your insights as to what are current trends you're seeing in the cell and gene therapy sector in general. Uh, Thomas, can we start with you, please? Yes, of course. So uh, just uh, yeah, a very few points in that regard. So first of all, I think we should, uh, should make clear to, to all of us that we actually have seen a very rapid development in the, of the field uh, from technology point of view within the past few years. So it's just 10 years ago that we have seen the approval of the autologous DC therapy ProVent in the United States, right? Back in, in, in 2010, as far as I remember, and it's just a few years ago that the, the first CAR-T therapy camera got approval. So uh, actually there, there happened a lot within only a very, yeah, how to say, small amount of time. And now we are seeing genetically modified immune cells in the market and there are even more sophisticated therapies arising at the horizon. So I'm talking about in vivo gene therapies for large indications and, and others. And this very rapid development of the field from my point of view brings chances uh, to provide a cure yeah, for many yet uncurable diseases, but at the same time also generates a lot of challenges for many, many cell and gene therapy stakeholders, among them the scientists, authorities, health systems and others, right? And this is certainly something we have to deal with just from the company's per perspective. What we quite frequently hear from our company partners is a shortage of educated staff uh, from technicians, uh, other lab staff, GMP educated staff, others. This is certainly something we have to deal with when we are talking with regulators, then uh, we are quite, quite often told that they uh, are, are facing challenges to uh, keep pace with the rapid development of the field from a technology point of view, right? So the same regulator who just uh, uh, published a regulation on autologous DC-based uh, therapies right now has to deal with in vivo gene therapies, uh, and this is certainly generating uh, challenges. In the scientific R&D, I, I don't want to go into detail. I'm certainly not a scientist here, but from my point of view, the, it's, it's pretty hard to say. <laughs> Surprising, uh, at least, uh, just to see uh, how uh, uh, more more methods for the manipulation genetic modification of cells become standard in in, in research and and, and R and D. So the design of cell, from my point of view, is arising at the horizon, which is specifically designed then to deliver the highest possible therapeutic value to a specific patients. So this is something what uh, just ten years ago, uh, uh, from the, the perspective of many, many people, uh, 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 just would have been something like science fiction or so, right? So this certainly is something what uh, is diff difficult, what's, what's generating challenges. Last trend, from my point of view, uh, the manufacturing translation trend. So the, the beautiful new world of potential cancer cures, from my point of view, can only become reality for the real life patients if we combine the scientific progress in cell and gene therapy R&D with the newest technologies from other areas, right? Like automation industry uh, 4.0 uh, concepts, artificial intelligence and others, right? And 
this combination of the, the most recent developments from many different technology areas is representing, from my point of view, the prerequisite for the further successful development of the field. Great. Yeah, that's basically it. And Thomas, you, you mentioned Provenge, which was mm -hmm. um, tr triggered a thought with me about, are we seeing developments or are you seeing any developments in relation to the reimbursement pathway? Because obviously that was a product which, as you say, was authorized, but then at least here in Europe came off the market, gave up its marketing authorization. Um, and I think Dendrion, the, the um, exactly, MA holder, yeah. in, in the end went into insolvency, I think. Yeah. So it's, it's back then it was proving, proving difficult to run a successful commercial model. And I'm just wondering if you've seen any changes on, in that regard. Yeah, so uh, regarding uh, Dendrion, I think we uh, yeah, should, should, should keep in mind that Dendrion uh, uh, 10 years ago, it's only 10 years ago at the end, was a kind of a first first mover, right, in this area. And as far as I know, I'm not that sure about this, but I think it took Dendrion 10 years uh, from the completion of their first pivotal phase three clinical trial until they got approval from the FDA. 10 years, right? And within this 10 years period, they still had to repeat some studies and, other, and to do other things. What um, can easily be explained by the simple fact that the regulatory authorities in the States, the FDA, uh, simply were, yeah, how to say, were overloaded uh, and uh, were challenged to some extent with just uh, uh, yeah, judging the, the safety and efficacy yeah. aspects of this new theory. And so Dendron was the, the very first mover in, in, in this area and then a, a number of further uh, companies followed. And uh, the point which I wanted to make is just, look, who at the time being is talking is still talking about autologous DC based therapies, right? So there are still some therapy developments ongoing, but nowadays we are talking about genetically modified cells and others. So. What I mean was that the field is so rapidly uh, developing. This is really something, yeah, that we, we should feel happy just to see this, right? Absolutely. Sharon, can, you, can I bring you in on this now and, and see what, what's the UK's view? What are you seeing in terms of the, the sector, both in the UK and internationally? I think when it comes to the reimbursement side of things, that uh, the Catapult has worked quite hard on this right, right from the beginning, right from its inception. Um, and we still haven't reached a position where, yes, there are um, really effective reimbursement strategies. However, I think there is a, a big push now to make sure that uh, to achieve the right reimbursement strategies, there is the proof of efficacy, because that seems to be where it breaks down. There was uh, the model for the first CAR-Ts where as long as there is uh, survival after a certain number of weeks, then there was reimbursement. But a certain number of weeks is just not enough to give the payers that kind of reassurance. And therefore, there's a lot of efforts going on on patient registries, patient follow up to give really clear data of the efficacy of these. And until we have that really clear data on the efficacy, that's the only way I think we're going to be able to push the payers to actually come up with a, a proper reimbursement strategy for these. But I think it's coming. I think the advanced therapy treatment centers that we are looking at within the UK are making great strides in this. And I think it's going to make a big difference to the, to the whole market. Great. And on the moving aside from reimbursement, on the trends in technology or other aspects, is there anything else that, that you're seeing? Yeah. Um, well, as Thomas was saying, there's, uh, there's been 10 um, therapies that have been um, approved in the, in the last few years within the cell and gene therapy market within Europe, which is absolutely uh, amazing. There's uh, so much in the pipeline coming through. I think. Um, advanced, sorry, um, adeno-associated viruses are really, really um, picking up in, in the number of uh, therapies that are coming through. But also a lot of the uh, biotechs have um, allogeneic therapies in their pipeline. That, that's increasing quite significantly, albeit really early stages still in the pipeline, but, but they are definitely becoming a lot more common. But there's also increased personali personalization of the therapies as well. It's a very complex process, um, manufacturing autologous uh, CAR-T therapies, and to increase that with uh, increased personalization of those makes the manufacturing process much more complicated, makes the supply chain infinitely more complicated. But the, the uh, kind of efficacies that some of these early therapies are getting are, are very impressive, so there's a move towards that. Um, 
And the, there's also a move. I think most of the people who are coming through with therapies are using the um, industry standard integrated prodigy system, where it's uh, almost a, a plug and play kind of system. Or I say that sitting here from the business development role, it seems very uh, plug and play. Um, however, I think there's a need if we're going to really get the maximum throughput of manufacturing facilities to move away from having this um, integrated system where the therapy must sit within the, uh, within the integrated system right through the whole of the manufacturing cycle and have a more modular approach. To do that, you need to have adaptive control. And that's something that the Catapult are really, uh, really looking to work towards where we have a modular system for manufacture of autologous therapies, but you have adaptive control so that you can handle the inconsistencies of the patient starting material. So I think uh, I'd, I'd like you to watch this space in terms of that kind of technology coming through. And, and Sharon, you mentioned increasing personalization even of already autologous therapies. So for people who might be listening to this and thinking to themselves, well, how does that work? What sort of personalization on top of using the patient's own cells are we talking about here? Well, if on a particular um, cancer, then there is a, a very um, individualized antigen rather than going for, for the standard antigens that most of the CAR Ts are going for. If you have a, a, a particular antigen that you identify and then you, um, you establish a method that you can target that particular antigen and then combine that with the CAR T, you, then you are then training the CAR -T, your, your own immune system to attack a very specialized um, uh, antigen on your particular cancer which is making a, a big change to the uh, to the manufacturing process and all of the supply chain around it. But Absolutely. it is very, very targeted. Interesting. And Arno, the, the, the view from Canada and from North America in particular, um, what, what can you add to what's already been said? Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the whole continent. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, bouncing on what uh, Sharon just mentioned about the, the Prodigy and the automated system. Um, in Canada, there's a bioreactor um, that, is, that has been um, put together by a company called Octane uh, that is located in Ontario. Uh, that is called the Cocoon. Um, and that I think shows great promises in the field as a all integrated bioreactor that further down the line should avoid um, most manipulations for autologous cell therapies. Um, and as far as a country of 35 million people, I think Canada is in a pretty good position uh, in cell gene therapy. We have very um, high-end um, CDMOs across the country whether it's in cell or vector, uh, vector manufacturing. Um, there's a few biotechs um, that are really leading the way in uh, novel therapies as well. Uh, I can give a couple of examples. One um, being Triumvira, um, based in Ontario. They're working on a uh, T-cell adapter, um, sorry, antigen coupler, the TAC technology that kind of like guides the T-cells towards the tumor but will instead of using a chimeric um, system, we'll actually use the TCR of the T cells and then use the endogenic um, signaling pathways of the T cells. Um, these hopefully uh, will um, help decrease the, the severity of the, the adverse events uh, in patients. Uh, another uh, company is called uh, Exalthera, it's a Montreal based company, uh, our neighbors, uh, were using a, um, a combination of cord blood based stem cells um, that they cultivate with um, a small molecule that allows um, great expansion without differentiation. Uh, and so far in the early clinical trials have shown um, very good uh, engraftment. Um, so those I think are two um, leading technologies that are slightly different from what we've seen so far. Um, the TAC compared to the CAR uh, and uh, the cord blood um, based stem cell um, technologies, uh, I think, are, are really, uh, really leading the way as well uh, in the immunotherapy uh, ecosystem. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, thank you for that. So if we, if, if we spend a few minutes now just looking at your respective organizations, because uh, it seems to me that 
I think in terms of how long they've been around, Fraunhofer IZI has been there first, I think set up in about 2008. And then the catapult came along in 2012, very much modeled on, on the Fraunhofer system in Germany. Um, and certainly from the catapult, which is the organization I know best of the three, it has the real public sector mandate, a public mandate to essentially foster the development of the ecosystem, particularly in the UK, uh, but also to, uh, as part of that, creating high value jobs, uh, solving market failure, so if, and also regulatory failure. So working on areas of um, clinical trials, authorizations, establishing regulatory pathways where they didn't previously exist, establishing reimbursement pathways where there were difficulties there, um, dealing with market failure around the provision of manufacturing services, those type of things, particularly I guess, larger scale manufacturing capability for um, larger trials and then moving into the commercial phase. So Catapult came along. Arno, you've described C3I as a CDMO, um, and I don't know to what extent it has a, a public mandate to go beyond that and, sim and, and, and similarly foster the sector and the ecosystem in Canada. But um, it would be quite interesting to, to get your perspectives on what you think of as the similarities and differences between the organization. So Arno, can I, can I start with you? Yeah, of course. Um, I think we all have a very similar um, model, um, yet slightly different uh, here and there. Um, C3I, we like to present ourselves as a one-stop shop for cell and gene therapy. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, we've been built around a CGMP manufacturing unit um, where we manu where our teams manufacture um, the products for our clients and partners. Uh, and we have the biomarker discovery and analytical development um, department as well as the CRO services. So we're really trying to bring to help our partners from the really early stage when uh, they start developing uh, their preclinical studies um, towards the clinical start of their adventure. Um, and once they're at the clinical uh, stage, we really try to help them wherever they need. So organizing their, clinic, their international clinical trials, uh, manufacturing for them, developing the tests that they will need to release their products um, because we don't only do um, sterility um, and safety tests anymore. Uh, so we have to develop those tests for our partners. Um, as far as our partners themselves, yeah, we do uh, have biotech clients across North America, um, but we'll, our, one of our missions is also to help um, leverage the local science. So whether it's in Montreal or across Canada, we have a, a Canadian, pan-Canadian mandate, not just a provincial mandate. Um, in order to help accelerate um, the path between the fundamental lab discovery up to the clinical trial and beyond, um, and make sure to shorten the window between the time of discovery and the time it actually gets commercialized. And Sharon, that, that sounds quite similar to how you might go about describing the catapult, but are there any, would you agree, are there any points of difference, different emphasis? Yeah, I, I think there's uh, there's quite a, a fundamental difference between the two. Uh, within the UK, well, the catapult is, um, as I think you, you introduced really well, better than I could, the, <laughs> the way the catapult works and in its remit. But it, um, it, it's trying not to distort the market and, where, and only get involved where there is market failure. And I think in the UK, there isn't a market failure at all when it comes to CDMOs for cell and gene therapies. I think we've got a, a wealth of cell and gene therapy CDMOs within the UK already that are doing really well. Oxford Biomedica, specialists in lentivirus. We have Cobra Biologics in Kiel, specialists in AAV and manufacturing lenti and manufacturing plasmid DNA. We have synthetic DNA from Touchlight um, Genetics. We've got viral vector full finish CDMO. So, so we, we really have a, a plethora of companies, Roslyn Cells, uh, Emetocyte as well. Um, so what, what we're looking to do is get involved to support the companies who need to be able to manufacture for themselves. So these are people who have processes that they really want to retain the IP for, uh, for their own business reasons, 
or they have such throughput that they couldn't rely on the capacity of CDMO because there isn't a CDMO that they believe would have the capacity to give them the reliability to take them right through to commercial because they are predicting that there's going to be a capacity crunch and to enable them to get the value from the investors into their company, they have to prove that they've got a reliable route through to commercialization. And so it was these kind of companies who, uh, and the investors in these companies who worked with the catapult to say, well, when these companies are coming to us, there's some great companies in the UK, great ideas, uh, but if we are going to buy into those ideas, buy into those companies, we're going to have to build them their own manufacturing facility, 25 million, 30 million each. And that's not what we do as an investor. And therefore, that's where the catapult came in and worked with them to come up with a model that might work, which is a cost sharing model, which the catapult um, supports it, it, it obtains the license, it maintains the facility, um, quality assurance, the uh, environmental monitoring, GMP warehousing, all the support infrastructure around. But the collaborators work within their module themselves to do their own manufacture, which means they have to have their own equipment, their own skilled staff. They, um, they need to do, handle all their manufacture within their own module. We, we can assist them in terms of layouts and working with them to get maximum throughput, but essentially they can do whatever they want within that module and retain their own IP and their own control over their manufacture. They may use CDMOs as well. So they may be bringing in lentivirus from the UK CDMOs, plasmid DNA, obviously using the viral vector fill, but they're, uh, if they say they're doing CAR-T, then they are completely looking after their own CAR-T. So it is quite different. And are they there long-term? Are they, in terms of their occupancy and your model there, can they stay as long as they like? Um, well, I think the collaborators tend to look to stay with the catapult until uh, or while they're building their own capacity, while they're building their own facilities, while they're working out how they will get themselves to commercial. But that's that always it ends up being a bit longer than they imagine. So uh, it takes about a year really to get into a GMP facility, um, well, up to a year, to get, get your own license, to um, start manufacturing GMP material and really get the benefits out of it. So the people aren't staying for less than a couple of years. Um, and during that time, they are then looking um, potentially for their own facilities. To, but this gives them the, the chance to set up their system, set up their quality system, train their staff, have a process ready to go so that they can establish their own manufacture and just move across with catapult support into their own facility. Great. And Thomas, then, so turning to Fraunhofer, IZI, um, and, and your activities, are there any points of difference, points of similarity, what would you say between C3i and the UK Catapult and yourselves? Yeah, that's it's pretty difficult to answer. From from my point of view, I think, um, yeah, we are to, 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 yeah, to some extent different from, from both the other organizations, right, from C3i and from, from Catapult, as at the end, and you mentioned this already, uh, the Fraunhofer Society as a whole is uh, representing a not-for-profit, at the end, governmentally owned applied research-oriented research organization, right? So I don't know exactly about the size of uh, UK Catapult, but uh, for the Fraunhofer whole organization, at least, we are pretty large. Almost 30,000. Uh, focusing on applied region areas. And the, the Fraunhofer model is quite, quite unique uh, from a worldwide perspective. And the, the reason why we were established back in 1949, uh, more or less at the end of the, the Second World War, was from the beginning on to support the development efforts of the industry and to help the reconstruction of the industry, right? And this is still at the heart of our mission. This is still our the core mission of the entire society to provide the, to, to provide the industry with everything what they may need to develop successful products, right? And this can be technologies, problem solutions, product candidates, services, consulting services, whatever the industry may need to uh, develop, as I said, successful products at the end. And as a matter of course, did we um, substantially expand our mission over the past uh, few decades and nowadays are supporting development efforts of the industry worldwide. Uh, but this is still our mission, right? And within the, the, the German research landscape, we are pretty well positioned just 
right between the left-hand sided university fundamental research uh, area and the right-hand sided industrial R&D area, right? Just sitting between, picking up innovative developments, innovative discoveries uh, resulting from our from fundamental research at our university partners or from our own internal research efforts, then developing them further and bringing them to the industry, right? So this is the role of Fraunhofer. And I think we are quite quite successful with it. And uh, Fraunhofer ICI, my institute, we were established back in 2005, so just 15 years ago. And it is also important to mention that uh, we are realizing applied research in quite a lot of different uh, uh, research areas, right? So cell and gene therapy, this is certainly representing our major business business unit. However, we also are pursuing R&D activities and other business units like drug and vaccine R&D for human and veterinary diseases. We are developing uh, diagnostics based on discovered clinically validated biomarkers of different kind. And we also are uh, uh, yeah, realizing uh, research attempts uh, in, in software engineering, automation, a couple of other things, right? So this is also something what I think what, what differentiates us from uh, other organizations is just the, 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 the pretty broad scope of our activities in total, right? And when it comes to the entire front of a society, then um, it is quite quite difficult to imagine a technology area where front of all, uh, would not have any activities in, right? So the technology profile of the entire organization, um, this is uh, certainly comprising the life science minority of seven out of 72 institutes, but all the other uh, institutes are realizing uh, applied research in whatever you could think of, right? From defense systems, physics, engineering, IT, energy, all the other things. There is a front of a Institute, which is doing re applied research in this, in this intern, just coming to the end. This is, from my point of view, something what is really special from, from Fraunhofer and what is really representing a USP for us, right? So the, the extremely wide scope of technology areas covered by the entire organization, this is certainly something what helps us to bring, even in the, the, the cell and gene therapy area, to bring different technologies together just for the sake of the development of the entire field, just, for example, in the automation area, right? So there are at least I'm, I'm, I'm aware, two or three Fraunhofer institutes that are doing nothing else but just auto developing uh, automated solutions for manufacturing, right? And it's pretty easy for us under the umbrella of the Fraunhofer system just to partner with them, and then to develop automated solutions for safety manufacturing. So this is something I think what is special for Fraunhofer and what we are quite, yeah, quite, quite, quite happy to, to have achieved. And what also could represent a base for correlation with uh, Catapult and for CDRI, of course. Yes. No, that's really interesting to hear about and, and, and understand the scope of the activities of Fraunhofer as, as a full-scale organisation. Um, I mean, all of this gives rise to some quite interesting thoughts about the way in which public money is used. And Sharon, you were stressing the fact that Catapult is careful not to intervene other than in circumstances of market failure. And obviously, there's a, there's a state aid regime. Um, and also, there's an IP model to be thought about, because you're all talking about and Sharon, you mentioned catapults clients, people who typically want to own their own IP, whether that's product related or process related coming out of the manufacturing center. So all of this goes into the mix um, and can probably give rise to some quite delicate and tricky trade-offs. But if we, one way to approach this is to think a bit about the funding models, I think. Um, and because I know the catapult well, I know the sort of the, the levels of funding it gets approximately 15 million pounds worth of public funding, which is then sort of topped up with some grant funding and um, some private sector research collaborations to about 25 million. That's probably a shade under, Thomas, I think what Fraunhofer IZI is doing. So I appreciate that Fraunhofer mm -hmm. as a, as a full-scale organization is, is orders of magnitude larger than that with, with billions of, of euros of revenue. But I think one interesting thing that struck me was that Fraunhofer seems to get a lower percentage, about 25% of its money from public sources and a much greater proportion from private sector collaboration. Um, whereas Catapult, mm -hmm. Sharon, um, it's sort of the other way around. Most of its money, well, more than 50% comes from public sources, a smaller proportion from private sector collaboration. And Arno, I have no idea about what the funding position is for, for C3I. Do you, do you get public subsidies? Um, do, you, do you have grants, block grants, whatever? Tell us a bit about that. 
Yeah, of course. Um, so C3I was actually created in 2016 of a federal government uh, grant called uh, CSER, um, which basically um, creates companies with public funds uh, and give them a mandate uh, of five years to basically become self-sustainable. Um, fast forward five years, uh, early 2021, uh, we're now in a position to be uh, in the self-sustainability, uh, which is great news because over the last five years, a lot of work has been put uh, towards this goal. Um, we, I'd say that now uh, we have most of our income from uh, partner uh, collaboration uh, and uh, client services throughout all our services. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't get any support from the, the governments. Uh, actually, just last week, the provincial uh, government just awarded um, a grant of several million dollars um, to our host institution, GMP Manufacturing Unit, the CETC, the Center of Excellence for Cell Therapy, um, to build their own uh, CGMP viral vector manufacturing platform. So although C3I still gets uh, a large amount of their funds from uh, client uh, contracts and uh, more private partnerships, uh, we also um, benefit from the, the government generosity. Uh, as a third model, that's more in the long term, um, we also invest uh, in biotech companies um, and we either uh, negotiate rights on commercialization on their products or uh, equity in the in their company but that's obviously a little more uh, long term than uh, than the first five year time frame and, and Sharon do you see on so the catapult of the three organizations seems to have the largest proportion of its funding coming from public sources will, will that continue does the catapult have ambitions to increase the proportion of revenue generating collaborations or is is that partly um because of its it, it's it's sort of emphasis on not doing what the private sector can do um and getting out of the way of the private sector is that always going to be the case that the bulk of the work will be publicly funded yes i think it, it will it will always be that case so if there is some some way in the market that you could do this at a market rate and it would be a viable business, then the catapult shouldn't be involved in doing that. And I think to date uh, on, the, on this call, what I've really concentrated on is the manufacturing center, but very much like the, uh, the Fraunhofer, we also do a lot of work sitting at the, uh, the link between uh, industry and, all, and academia and do a lot of uh, translational work and, and some fee-for-service work. Um, at the manufacturing center, we have a, a very uh, unusual, I think, cost risk sharing model where um, the collaborators share the cost of operating the center, but the catapult takes the risk on under occupancy. So it makes it uh, very uh, easy for the collaborators to really start their own manufacture without taking on huge costs. But when we are, we do do some fee for service work with, um, with uh, part, uh, sorry, companies within the UK. But we also do a lot of uh, CR&D, as you said, and also some collaborative projects where we are looking at projects that the catapult would like to achieve. And so the catapult will put some of the um, work in at its, at its own cost and a collaborating company will put some of the effort in at their cost. And then we're both sharing the outputs that are coming out of that because we're all looking for, for the same output at the end. So we do a lot of that work as well. And in, in CR&D, which you've just mentioned, it'd be quite interesting just to understand um, from my niche as an IP lawyer, what, what models you run as a, from an IP point of view. Um, do you try and own the outputs of those, um, of those collaborations but grant licenses? Or do you allow the parties to, the, your counterparties to own the outputs, but you retain rights, for example, for teaching, further research, dissemination through the sector. Obviously that comes up against issues around exclusivity and, and what your partner's hoping to achieve, but how do you square that circle? I think it very much depends on the particular project. So at uh, say the manufacturing center, if we deal with that one first, that's a bit simpler because what we want to do is for all the collaborators to have all the IP 
that comes out of that. So the idea is that the, um, the catapult has established the center and then the collaborators and the catapult work together to establish the systems to support high throughput manufacture. And without the collaborators manufacturing in there, coming up with the challenges and working with us to resolve those challenges, then this IP wouldn't be able to be created. But the fact that it is created enables the catapult to help the next collaborator who comes along. So as long as the IP that is generated is severable from the collaborator's actual process IP, so we don't, we don't want to know how they're actually manufacturing their CAR T because that's really important to that company and they need to retain that. But if we're talking about novel ways to handle waste handling uh, of viral vectors, uh, ways to uh, store and transport patient material and um, cryo uh, freeze it uh, at, on site, and uh, reduce the vein to vein time in terms of the, the support services that are around that, then that's IP that is useful for everybody. So that's how we do it. So the IP is created and then everybody has the right to use that IP. Um, and then when it comes to um, CR&D projects that we're doing together, then generally what we're looking for is a position where um, the, the shared outputs that we're looking for are a little bit different from either side. So. Like, like with the orange, if somebody's really looking for the orange peel that comes out of the orange and someone's looking for the fruit, that's the I ideal position. So hopefully we, we reach a position where the catapult wants the learnings from the project that they can apply to the next project and wants to have access to the, um, uh, the, the, the technology IP. But the collaborator that we're working with might really want it just for their asset to develop that asset and, and everything that's non-severable from that stays with the collaborator. And generally we find a, a very easy way through this. Fascinating. And Arno, what, what, what's your model when it comes to these type of issues around the, the outputs, the foreground? That's a good question. Um, we are, as I explained earlier, we're more of a, a standard uh, CDMO, if you want, um, although we're not standard. Uh, we're very much um, <laughs> very special. <laughs> advanced, a very special. Um, no, I think on our side, to be honest, we are uh, relying a lot. And I'm, I actually find what uh, Sharon just said uh, fascinating uh, on the fact that um, Catapult is developing all those tools on the side to support uh, cell engine therapy partners. Uh, on our side, we very much rely on the existing um, services out there. Um, storage, transportation, um, monitoring, etc. Um, probably because of our young age uh, and our rather small structure. Um, but yeah, no, I think um, there is definitely a uh, a future uh, in developing all those tools because there are actually very few. Uh, of these services around are reliable um, and that you can trust on a, on a daily basis. Um, so I think having a, your own being developed is great. Um, on our side, of course, we have external um, partners. Uh, we are also very lucky to be um, hosted by a hospital. Um, so a lot of the infrastructure for the local projects are very much handled by the, the host institution. Um, and I'd say on top of that, um, it gives C3I and maybe C3I's teams a little bit of an edge on the patient outcome view, um, because being hosted at the heart of the hospital that is specializing in hemato-oncology and cell therapy, all our teams see patients every day in the corridors. Uh, the beds are just two floors up. Um, and I think it gives um, to our team this understanding and of the importance of the work that they do. Um, so although we're not creating very much technological based assets, uh, I think having this environment, this particular hospital environment um, really um, helps advancing the technologies faster because our teams and our staff um, understand the clinical reality. Must, must be very motivating. Very Thomas, sure. from, um, from a Fraunhofer perspective, can you talk us through a bit about the, the, how, how you deal with outputs and shared IP and that type of thing? Does it all belong to the customer? So uh, not at all. Uh, so 
primarily this uh, really depends on just the type of project, right? So we, which we are pursuing with the, the, the partner. And as I said already, uh, Fraunhofer realizes quite a very diverse set of uh, project types with with partners what is uh, starting from simple contract research contract testing contract manufacturing fee for service like models and uh, comes up at the at the end uh, with joint r d or any other rather research type projects most of them taking place under public funding or funding from third sources right so there's everything possible with Fraunhofer. So in typical CRO, uh, CMO projects with our partners, uh, we uh, usually get just asked to, to, to perform a specific working step or perform a specific uh, workload. So to say for a partner, just for example, manufacturing a certain type of cell and gene therapy. And then of course, uh, even for your manufacturing product, Will the, the IP related uh, to the project uh, stay entirely with the customer? That's for sure. As otherwise, we would not be able to survive as a CMO, uh, CRO uh, type of organization in that area. If we are talking about joint development projects with industry partners, and as I said, uh, most of them are taking place uh, in Germany uh, under public funding, then we are talking about a situation where that could result on our end uh, uh, our IP, so our foreground IP as a being a part of the project result. And then of course, we uh, do have to negotiate with the, the, the company partner, with the company partners about how to deal with foreground IP after the end of the, the joint research project. And as Farnover is still representing a governmentally owned research organization, are we not allowed of course to commercialize products by our own? So that's simply not our business. So in almost all cases, we simply grant a license for the jointly developed product or technology or whatsoever to the industry partner. This is something what we are quite, uh, yeah, what we, we, we frequently uh, do. So on an annual basis, Fraunhofer closes uh, almost 500 license contracts with industry partners. So I think we are pretty experienced with this. And this is something what, what usually works without, uh, without problems. Yep. Great. Now we've we've talked a bit about um, assistance with regulatory pathways, with reimbursement mm. pathways, with I guess with development of assays, um, potency mm. assays, and other things. But we we come back to the manufacturing aspect because I guess it's um, it's it's easy for people to get their hands around and understand. And I saw Thomas um, when I was mm. doing a bit of background reading before this session that I understand that Fraunhofer IZI has has a commercial scale manufacturing contract with Novartis in relation to Kimria. Mm. Um, and that triggered a thought in my mind about Novartis has, has its own uh, US based manufacturing for that autologous mm. therapy. And I was just wondering, are we seeing a trend that as gene therapies are, or in that case, cell therapies are, um, mm. CAR T therapies are being authorized and rolled out. What are we seeing in terms of the, the manufacturing network that is required to support that. Are the pharma companies typically manufacturing in one place and then looking to do, have great logistics in terms of, the, as Sharon said, the vein to vein um, turnaround time, or are they looking to um, distribute their manufacturing? So they have globally, they have various places of manufacture where they do tech transfer and the same process is being run in order to reduce the vein to vein time. What, what are you seeing? Yeah, so this is very difficult to answer as it certainly may, may depend on the, the, the type of company, right? So every company may have its own strategies in that regard. Regarding uh, Novartis, yes, of course, uh, we are currently manufacturing Camaraya for them. Uh, this is uh, on, a, on a limited base as uh, it is not originally part of our mission to manufacture uh, marketed products. However, we are allowed to do this for uh, a certain limited uh, period of time of a few years until our company partner uh, has established own manufacturing facilities, right? What Novartis is, is currently doing, obviously. 
um, regarding their manufacturing strategy. I'm also I, 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 I'm not allowed to speak for the waters, of course. However, what 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 we know and what is what is public knowledge is that they established manufacturing sites just uh, across the globe, right? So there is a manufacturing site in Europe, and the the current main manufacturing site is front of our uh, ICI. We are manufacturing Cumbria for the European market, and there are a number of further manufacturing activities of of, of Novartis in Europe, which within the next I don't know months or or years will uh, just just uh, take over the commercial manufacturing. Um, in, in the States or in Asia, Novartis is just doing the manufacturing with other partners, right? So they have a partner organization, as far as I know, in every part of the world. And this is, I would say, kind of a typical model for, for a number of uh, cell and gene therapy companies. I'm, I'm aware of they are at least looking for manufacturing partners in every region of the world. So in Europe, North America, uh, Asia, uh, and that's basically it, right? regarding the decentralized manufacturing. So this is something what one certainly could argue about, right? So I'm, I'm listening to, to some people and, and, and companies pretty, pretty much in, in, in favor of uh, yeah, uh, uh, placing a manufacturing device like the Prodigy or any other sort of device uh, uh, just next to the, the uh, surgery room in the, the, the hospital. And then the, the, the people there shall do just the, the manufacturing parallel to their, their other tasks. I still do not really feel so convinced of the success of this model as at least what I'm hearing from German hospitals is that all the physicians uh, working there, they are not really keen to take over additional GMP manufacturing work. So I don't know to what extent this may work, but this is, might, may also, of course, depend on the type of therapy we are talking about, right? So I think for the, the upcoming years, at least, we will will see manufacturing models with globally distributed manufacturing sites, maybe one or two manufacturing sites just for, for risk management uh, in, in, in every on every uh, continent. And this is what, from my point of view, will just uh, stay the main model, at least for a foreseeable time. Thank you. Yeah. And Arno, could, could you see C3i fitting into that type of uh, network of global manufacturing sites. Would you do commercial scale manufacture for those type of authorized products? Uh, it was definitely the, one of our goals uh, down the line is to, to reach the, the commercial capacity for, for products uh, in Canada and help uh, the, the Canadian ecosystem evolve in that way. Um, but yeah, I'd say I, I, I agree with Thomas on that one that uh, Although the, the decentralized mm. model has been um, discussed, debated um, mm. plenty of times over the last few years, um, as long as we don't have a reliable device, um, mm. bioreactor that can be put on the bedside and that operator can use um, very reliably, I don't think we're going to see that centralized model uh, change anytime soon. Um, mm. That being said, uh, there is more and more uh, CMOs being built all across North America and, um, and Europe and uh, other parts of the world. So I think that will definitely facilitate um, the, the logistics of those, uh, the manufacturing of those products. Uh, and as I was mentioning just earlier, um, some companies are taking the lead on every part of support. Uh, you have the vein to vein follow up, you have the transportation, you have the storage, um, the matching of donors to uh, patients. All these are, are now taken care of. So if the network uh, is being built um, this way, I think. It'll be, a, it'll be a successful model, even if we're not fully decentralized. And obviously C3i is already part of that network uh, across North America with uh, for the projects we're working on, even if they're not commercial. Um, but yeah, I think in the, um, in the future, if we have the opportunity to work for and to manufacture for companies like Novartis or, or Gilead, of course, um, we, would, uh, we would be able to scale up to that. And, and Sharon, could you see a uh, an authorized product being made at the catapult center, perhaps as a stopgap until 
their own manufacturing facilities were set up? Uh, yes, I, I, I think so. We've got collaborators who are uh, reaching that point and getting to that point is obviously really difficult, really challenging. And if we insisted that our first collaborator, collaborator who was getting to that point had to move out and establish this for themselves, I think it would put them in, in a, a very difficult position. And therefore, I think we need, we need to um, make sure that we support them through to their early commercial, I think. So we're coming up against time. So just two two final questions from me, if that's OK. Right at the top of the call, Sharon, you, you mentioned um, increasing numbers of biopharma companies have um, allergenic assets in their portfolio. And that intrigued me because I think, I mean, thinking about CAR-T, I think the, the founder team behind Kite, I understand, have now founded the company focused on an allergenic um, approach to, to cell therapy. Um, which potentially reduces some of these issues around at least the, the logistics involved in, 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 the, in the autologous supply chain. Um, is, is that near? Is that far? How close are we to, to um, allergenic cell therapies, do you think? I think we are still um, qu quite a way off. Um, and but I, but I think that once we, once we overcome a few of the hurdles, so if it's um, pluripotent stem cell derived, the, um, the, the differentiation characterization of the, uh, of the cell therapy, I think as, as soon as we get over those challenges, it will be a very rapid move because unlike the CAR-Ts where the manufacturing challenges are quite significant, the manufacturing challenges that will be associated with allergenic therapies moving forward are going to be so much simpler because it's very much based on manufacturing um, technologies that are out there at the moment. And therefore I think we'll get over the hurdle and then it will, will move really, really quickly. But um, yes, we, we are quite a way off, I think, um, yeah, preclinical and very early stage clinical trial. But there are so many in the pipeline through some of the really big players that I'm, I'm sure it's not going to be that long. Interesting. And Thomas, is that, is that chime with what you're seeing in relation to allergenic therapy work? We've lost Thomas. Oh, no. <laughs> let's move to you. Sorry, still muted. So, ah. yes, I, I, what, what I already was <laughs> saying was that I absolutely agree with what uh, Sharon said. So uh, we also see a pretty bright future for allergenic therapies as those therapies may comply much better with typical uh, pharma uh, reimbursement models and also may help to, to reduce the manufacturing costs. So uh, there are a number of such allergenic therapies under development. Uh, some of them uh, coming from the NK cell area, what may have the, the potential from my point of view to become just the next big wave uh, in the cell and gene therapy field. So just an allergenic, uh, uh, genetically modified NK cells based on NK cell lines, NK92 or things like that. This is certainly something what we will see coming in the future, I think. And uh, Ono, anything to add in relation to allergenic therapies and trends you're seeing? Yeah, I I agree 100% with uh, with Sharon and Thomas. Uh, I think it's coming fast. Um, you have companies who are working on models to decrease um, significantly their their manufacturing costs, starting from uh, cell banks uh, of iPSCs and differentiating them in different types of cells um, and going for. Uh, maybe an order of magnitude of 10 of difference uh, in the price uh, for those immunotherapies. Um, but you also have companies that are not in the immunotherapy. We've, we've talked a lot about immunotherapy, but in the regen regenerative uh, disease um, medicine, sorry, uh, part like uh, Blue Rock in the, the US and Canada, uh, we're working also with iPSCs and uh, in conditions like uh, Parkinson's or, or heart failure. Um, and these, I think, hold a really bright future. Um, it's a very complicated uh, technology um, based on um, healthy donor material and cell banks. Um, but I think these, uh, once their proof of concept is in the clinic, can actually move really fast because they answer um, a need 
uh, that hasn't been uh, met yet. Sure, sure, understood. Well, that brings us, I think, to the last question, which is slightly tongue in cheek, but I'll ask each of you in turn. So do you see each other as competitors or collaborators? Uh, Sharon, I'll start with you. Um, absolutely um, not competitors and definitely uh, collaborators. Although to date with the, uh, the people on the call, we haven't done any collaborations. Um, however, um, like the Fraunhofer, the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult is part of a, a network of different catapults, which are involved in uh, digital technologies, um, the, the medicines discovery catapult as well, looking at um, a lot of the manufacturing technologies. We do collaborations with, with a few of those catapults, with academia um, and with um, various different organizations throughout the world, whether they are research technology organizations, contract manufacturers, we, we work with as well. And so none of these uh, companies are competitors. And uh, we are bringing together, I think, more and more large consortia to work together rather than everybody working on their own. I think the Advanced Therapy Treatment Centers is a really good example of that within the UK, which was coordinated by the Catapult. We've got multiple therapy developers, um, clinical uh, delivery companies, uh, and also the, the hospitals themselves, supply chain companies, working together to standardize the delivery of cell and gene therapies, handling of patient material, reimbursement strategies, and everything that's really needed to deliver cell and gene therapies in the UK. And I think these pre-competitive consortia are, are making huge strides within uh, the cell and gene therapy industry. That's really interesting. Thomas, your quick answer. So what can be a quick answer to such a difficult question? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, primarily, uh, yes, there's huge correlation potential with both organizations. So uh, in the past decade, I had a number of talks with Safety Catapult, and we'll be happy to continue with these talks and to explore correlation potential with uh, CGI. We are already in the process, I could say so, right? Just to, to explore correlation opportunities. You may know that I'm on the board of directors of CGI. And uh, this is really, from our point of view, representing a huge chance for us just to, to, to get the opportunity to serve uh, companies, uh, European companies, which uh, at the same time also have the intention to start uh, the North American market. And it would be great just to collaborate with CGI in, in this area, right? Uh, by uh, just uh, adjusting our, our quality system and things like that. So this makes absolutely sense. Regarding uh, the competition part of your question, no, with CGI, certainly not. We simply having activities in different, different geographic uh, locations, but uh, instead is generating uh, very promising creation opportunities. With Selfie, we catapult. Hmm, I'm, I'm not that, sh that sure, so to say, right? But however, my impression from Catapult is, but Sharon, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, those guys are mainly serving UK companies, right? And uh, Fraunhofer, we are not having activities on site in the UK and vice versa. So I also think uh, there is not, we are not really in a competition position with Stealth We Catapult. And at the end, I think the market is large enough for all of us. So we'll be happy to explore correlation opportunities with Catapult as well. Great. Yep. Well, we've. I, I think that brings us to time. Uh, we could go on forever, I think, because there's so much that could be, could be discussed between the three of us. But I think it just remains for me to thank you all really sincerely for giving up your time to take part in this um, roundtable presentation for Genesis 2020. Um, and I'll just hand back over to Tony then to wrap up. Thank you, Adrian. Just I'd like to echo your thoughts to our our panel and indeed to yourself for expertly moderating through. I think for me, it, it delivered what I hoped the Around the World series of, of discussions would do. And that was just a, a really insightful tour a little bit of how people see it from their perspective, but also great models to compare and contrast and learn from. So from myself and the One Nucleus team, thank you all for taking the time out to share that. And we'll look forward to sharing the, the recording of this webinar with the Genesis delegates. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Thanks very much, everybody. Lovely to meet you all. Bye.